this has uh, nothing to do with the message, which we're going to get to in just a moment. But as we were singing that song, I was just reminded of an article I read yesterday uh, about gambling. Um, I was a kid living in New Jersey when gambling first became legal there. It was such a big deal because it had only been in Las Vegas since then. Now, uh, thanks to cell phones and a change of laws, people can gamble almost any time, any place. Um, uh, a friend of mine was at a Phillies game recently. He said he was stunned at the number of people who spent the whole game on their phone. But then he realized they, they weren't like doing TikTok and stuff. You can bet like on the, not just the outcome of the game, but like the next pitch. It's gonna be a ball. You can bet on like everything. $55 billion, billion with a B in revenue in the United States last year. Not to the gamblers. <laughs> um, and, and, and to things you don't know anything about, right? You think you don't know what the outcome is going to be. In Christ, we have blessed assurance. You want to spend your time and your gifts on something with an assured ending? Spend your time with Christ, on Christ, with telling people about Christ. There's no, that's no gamble. That's assurance. Maybe that does have something to do with the sermon this morning. Let's pray. As we pray, I'm going to be silent for a few moments and ask you to pray these three things, that God would touch your heart and teach you what he wants you to learn today. That those around you would hear the word of God and accept it. And that I would be faithful in the preaching of his word today. Let's pray. Lord God, teach each of us and all of us. We pray that we would cherish your word to us this morning. To help us hear your word and obey it. Please help me to be faithful to your word and what you would have me say. Help all of us to take your word and apply it to our lives. All this in Jesus' name. Assurance is something that we, we want, and it's something we can have, but it must be of the right thing. I first heard this story from Mark Dever. He preached a sermon called False Conversion, the Suicide of the Church. And he read from a story called Salvation by Langston Hughes, who was a famous American poet and social activist and novelist and playwright. And these are Hughes' words. I was saved from sin when I was going on 13, but not really saved. It happened like this. There was a big revival at my Auntie Reed's church. Every night for weeks, there had been much preaching and singing, praying and shouting, and some very hardened sinners had been brought to Christ, and the membership of the church had grown by leaps and bounds. Just before the revival ended, they held a special meeting for children to bring the young lambs to the fold. My aunt spoke of it for days ahead. That night, I was escorted to the front row and placed on the mourner's bench with all the other young sinners who had not yet been brought to Jesus. My aunt told me that when you were saved, you saw a light and something happened to you inside and Jesus came into your life and God was with you from then on. She said you could see and hear and feel Jesus in your soul. I believed her. I heard a great many old people say the same thing and it seemed to me that they ought to know. So I sat there calmly in the hot, crowded church, waiting for Jesus to come to me. The preacher preached a wonderful, ryth rhythmical sermon. All moans and shouts and lonely cries and dire pictures of hell. And then he sang a song about the 99 safe in the fold and the one little lamb left out in the cold. Then he said, won't you come? Won't you come to Jesus? Young lambs, won't you come? And he held out his arms to all us young sinners on the mourner's bench. The little girls cried. Some of them jumped up and went to Jesus right away. Most of us just sat there. A great many old people came and knelt around us and prayed. Old women with jet black faces and braided hair. Old men with work gnarled hands. And the church sang a song about the lower lights are burning. Some poor sinners to be saved. And the whole building rocked with prayer and song. Finally, all the young people had gone to the altar and were saved. Except one boy and me. He was a rounder son named Wesley. 
Wesley and I were surrounded by sisters and deacons praying. It was very hot in the church and getting late now. Wesley said to me in a whisper, man, I'm tired of sitting here. Let's get up and be saved. And so he got up and was saved. Then I was left all alone on the mourner's bench. My aunt came and knelt at my knees and cried while prayers and songs swirled all around me in the little church. The whole congregation prayed for me alone in a mighty, mighty wail of moans and voices. And I kept waiting serenely for Jesus, waiting, waiting, but he didn't come. I wanted to see him, but nothing happened to me, nothing. I wanted something to happen to me, but nothing happened. I heard the songs and the minister saying, why don't you come, my dear child, why don't you come to Jesus? Jesus is waiting for you. He wants you. Why don't you come? Sister, read, what is this child's name? Langton, my aunt sobbed. Langton, why don't you come? Why don't you come and be saved? O oh, Lamb of God, why don't you come? Now it was getting really late. I began to be ashamed of myself holding up everything so long. I began to wonder what God thought about Wesley, who certainly hadn't seen Jesus either, but was now sitting proudly on the platform, swinging his knickerbockered legs and grinning at me, surrounded by deacons and old women on their knees praying. God had not struck Wesley dead for taking his name in vain or for lying in the temple, so I decided that maybe, to save further trouble, I'd better lie too and say that Jesus had come and get up and be saved. And so I got up. Suddenly the whole room broke into a sea of shouting as they saw me rise. Waves of rejoicing swept the place. Women leapt in the air. My aunt threw her arms around me. The minister took me by the hand and led me to the platform. When things quieted down in a hushed silence punctuated by a few ecstatic amens, all the new young lambs were blessed in the name of God. Then joyous singing filled the room. That night, for the first time in my life, but one, for I was a big boy, 12 years old, I cried. I cried in bed alone and couldn't stop. I buried my head under the quilt, but my aunt heard me. She woke up my uncle and told my uncle I was crying because the Holy Ghost had come into my life and because I'd seen Jesus. But I was really crying because I couldn't bear to tell her that I lied, that I deceived everybody in the church, that I hadn't seen Jesus, and now I didn't believe there was a Jesus anymore. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, please turn to Hebrews chapter 6. We're actually going to read the last few verses out of chapter 5. This story, just to punctuate how important it is that we be true with the gospel, that we work with people and disciple them to be certain people are, are, are saved, because people can come and be close and not be saved. So I'm going to pick up at, at Hebrews 5, 11, just for context, and I'm going to read through 6, verse 8. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For a land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So again, we're focusing on chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I wanted to mention those other verses from chapter 5, because when we looked at the first two verses of chapter 6 last week, about moving on from the elementary doctrines, right, he had said He'd been talking about uh, deep things of the faith. He'd been talking, he introduced the idea of this, this 
mysterious priest king called Melchizedek. He started with those things, and then he, he suddenly sort of stops. About this, we have a lot to say, but it's hard to explain because you become dull of hearing. And then as we pick up in, in, in chapter 6 and move forward, he, 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 he stops here and he says, let's leave these elementary doctrines behind. Now, he doesn't mean let's let go of those doctrines. I, I mentioned this last week, important, I think, to repeat. The, these are important doctrines. These are vital doctrines. These are the basic ones. He's just saying it's time to grow from those. So just like you can't do calculus if you don't know 1 plus 1 equals 2, and you can't write your doctoral thesis if you, if you can't spell C-A-T, cat, right? Those elementary things are vital. As a matter of fact, listening to, to Mark Dever preach, he said, if, if you're here today and you accept Christ and you become a Christian, you know the most important doctrines right now. It is Jesus who saves. But as we grow in the faith, as we mature and move on, it's time to keep those as a foundation, but to grow beyond those things. And he says he wants to do that. And in verse 3, he says, and this we will do if God permits. That's where we ended last week. He will move forward if God permits. And we know that God did permit because we simply look over to chapter 7 and see he picks back up talking about Melchizedek and back into the deeper things. And we spent a lot of time talking last week about that phrase, how important it is to realize that, that if God permits, right, if the, if the Lord is willing, that we'll be able to move and do things that we plan on doing. But it just hit me again this week how seriously the author took this. He wasn't planning on teaching them these, these deeper doctrines next fall. Like we're going to finish our summer series and next fall we'll pick up in that. Or, or next year sometime we'll pick up. No, he was going to begin again in just a few sentences. A few minutes of his writing, he was going to begin to talk about that again. So he realized that, that if it is God's will, it does apply if we're planning to do something next year, next month, next week, tomorrow, or 30 seconds from now. Right? That God's sovereignty is, is that thorough. It's that complete. And so the writer here, I think, really shows what his his character is, his thinking is about the sovereignty of God by saying even since the, the next paragraph is in God's hands. If God's willing, we'll get there. Then, moving on to verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, this is where the impossible comes in, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. Well, that first four words, these four words, it, for it is impossible. They're powerful words. They're introduction to something that's horrific. First of all, the, the use of the word impossible, we know what impossible means, right? It's, we, we sometimes use it for things that are just really hard, but impossible means M, I am not, not possible. This is something that cannot happen. Not something that's difficult, not something with low odds. This is something that cannot happen. So we know that this is something that's in, the, it's, it's in human hands, but it's overseen by the sovereign, omnipotent God. For with God, nothing is impossible. But in, in, for these humans who have done this thing that, that he's getting ready to talk about, it is impossible for them to turn back to Christ. That's a hard thing to hear. But he says it here very clearly. There's a time coming when it's too late to be saved. That there are people who are gathered there in this group that he's writing to, some of whom are, are Christians and some of who I think look like Christians but are not Christians, and he's saying there's a time coming. He's warned them about this earlier. Right? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But there are people gathered there. They've come to church with them. They sing the songs. They pray the prayers. They listen to the sermon. They shake hands. They go out. There's people who have experienced something, and yet they're not Christians. He goes on and says, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, they've been enlightened, 
They've heard the words of the gospel. They've heard the truth of the gospel. They've heard the truth of who Jesus is, of what Jesus has done, and where Jesus now is, and what Jesus is now doing. They've heard it. They've tasted the heavenly gift, and, and that may mean that they've shared in the Lord's Supper, or that may mean that they've just, in general, received blessings from being part of a church. He goes on to say they've shared in the Holy Spirit. This cannot mean that they have received the Holy Spirit. I'll, I'll explain that in a few moments. It cannot mean that. It means instead that they have been inside of a spirit-filled community and taking part again of the blessings of being part of the church. They've been part. They've been there. They've looked like us. And they've fallen away. Seven times in the book of Hebrews so far, Psalm 95 was quoted. Seven times. Three times in chapter 3, four times in in chapter 4. And in Psalm 95, verses 6 through 11, he talks about the book of Numbers. He's talking about during the Exodus, when they've, when they've come to the Promised Land. You can find it in Numbers 13 and 14. The nation of Israel had gone to Egypt initially to be saved from a famine centuries before. Joseph was already there. He'd been sold into slavery by his brothers. He ended up in Egypt in slavery. He ended up in Egypt in prison. And then he ended up as Pharaoh's right-hand man. He was in charge of many things. His plan had preserved food for all the nation of Egypt as well as others who would come to purchase from them. And so, in a time of famine, guess who shows up? His brothers show up. They don't know it's Joseph. They don't know that Joseph is there. And through God's sovereign hand, Israel was saved through something that they had done that was evil. But through the sovereign hand of God doing what was good and right out of that. We, that should remind us of Peter's explanation of the cross when he's preaching in Acts 2, when he says that Jesus, at the hand of sinful men, but by the foreknowledge and the will of plan, and plan of God, was crucified. Well, after, after that, they, they lived in Egypt for some time and, and then had four centuries of being enslaved in Egypt. And then God came to rescue his people, and he raised up a deliverer named Moses. And through Moses, God reveals his might. When Pharaoh has his heart hardened and doesn't want to let them go, there are the plagues, miraculous plagues that came upon Egypt. Then the Passover and the death of the firstborn and God rescuing those who were under the blood of the lamb. If you remember the Passover story, God continued to show his might as Pharaoh finally relented and let uh, the, uh, the Hebrews go and then changed his mind and the, the mighty Egyptian army had them pinned between themselves and the Red Sea. But we know the story, right? God opened the Red Sea. Didn't just open the Red Sea, but he made the ground dry so that the nation of Israel could pass through on dry land. And then as the Egyptian army enters into the same area, it becomes muddy again and their chariot wheels get stuck. The sea closes. Israel turns around and sees Egypt destroyed. They continue on. They see water from a rock. They see manna from heaven. They see the mighty hand of God working for their benefit, working on their behalf at every turn, at every moment when they needed him. And they get to the promised land. And they send spies into Canaan to figure out their next step. From Numbers chapter 13, you hear this. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation to show them the fruit of the land. You may remember that they were carrying the bundles of grapes that were so large that it took two men to carry them. They, they told them, we came to a land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. 
Besides that, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. When the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. They, they describe them as giants, and they're, and they're fearful. They, they don't want to go, and Caleb says, let's go, and they don't want to go. They had seen God do all of these incredible things, brought them all the way to the promised land, ready to go in, and suddenly the God who brought the plagues, the God who brought the Passover, the God who opened the sea and closed it on their enemies, who fed them from heaven and gave them water from a rock, suddenly was not very powerful in their eyes. Over in chapter 14. Well, first they had said, it would be better for us to die in the wilderness than to die in that land. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead body shall fall in this wilderness and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land which I swore that I would make you dwell. They came all the way. They looked like everybody else. They participated in all the same things everyone else heard. They, they, they heard the words of the law. They heard all of this. They saw the miracles. They were right there. And they rejected God. They rejected God. Only Joshua and Caleb and the young ones were saved. Everyone else went back to the wilderness and died in the wilderness. They rejected God, and God rejected them. Well, that's what the author of Hebrews has been referring to all the way through chapters 3 and all the way through chapter 4, saying, you hear, don't harden your hearts. Don't be like those people. We know what happened to those people. He's writing to an, initially to a Hebrew audience. They knew that story very well. That brings us to verses 7 and 8. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse, um, verse 6. They have fallen away, so it's impossible then to, to restore them to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their harm and holding him up to contempt. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying there, they have rejected the work of Christ on the cross. You know, we say it often when we're talking about the gospel that every single person has two choices, Right? We either stand before God willing to take the, the, uh, pay the payment for our own sin, which is an eternity in punishment, eternity in, in, in hell, or we back up under the cross and let the punishment that Christ took be our payment. Everyone, every single person is going to do one of those things. Every single person must do one of those two things. And if they are not accepting Christ, if they're rejecting him, then again, it's like saying they're, they're crucifying him again. They're, they're ignoring what has happened, what Christ has done, the work that he has done on their sake. And then the verses 7 and 8. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God, right? So, so people who receive the good news of the gospel, who turn in repentance to Christ, they're blessed. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. That thorns and thistles may sound familiar, because I hear Genesis 3 just sort of screaming out through these verses. We remember this story also, that Satan tempting Adam and Eve to take the fruit Adam's there with Eve. Eve takes the fruit. God confronts them. Then he proclaims a curse. First, he curses the serpent, Satan. And we hear the first utterance of the gospel there in Genesis 3, where, where um, God says, yeah, one day 
The serpent's going to nip at the heel of the Messiah, but the Messiah is going to crush the serpent. And then the curse is on the, on the woman and the man, and the curse continues even to the ground. They're going to go out of the garden, where they had to work the garden, but all of their work was fruitful, all the work was pleasant. They're going to go to a place where the ground would be cursed. Pain would be experienced in order to, to produce fruit. Why? What was going to be coming up out of the cursed ground? Thorns and thistles, Genesis 3 says. He curses the ground because of you, in pain you shall eat of all of your days, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. These thorns and thistles are representative of the sin that came into the world. So this is what the author of Hebrews is, is referring to. For those who, who produce a, a fruit that is useful, who have received Christ, repented and turned to him, produce a, a useful fruit. But for those who reject Christ, Thorns and thistles, sin continues in their life. Sin continues in their life all the way into eternity for rejecting Christ. There's horror in rejecting Christ. So there's a warning here. It's not just here, it's all through Scripture. As certainly as one day, after all those years, all those months of working and, and hammering and, and sawing and all that, one day came and the door of the ark shut. And when the door of the ark shut, the only people who would be saved were the people in the ark. Everyone else died in the flood. This is why the gospel is absolutely urgent. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We don't know if there will be tomorrow, but as long as it is today, Hebrews tells us, as long as it is today, as long as you wake up and you still have this day and you're, and you're still here, you still can turn to Christ. Don't harden your hearts, he tells us, as they did. Again, this is why the gospel is so urgent. It's why we have to go where we're sent to tell people the good news. Tell people that they were created in the image of God, but that the, the sin brought into this world by our first parents has abused that image of God in us. And it created a chasm between us and God that we can't get across. There's no way across it. But praise God in his mercy, he sent Jesus, God the Son, who came and crossed that chasm to get us. If we believe in him and repent of our sins, submit to him as Lord, Savior, and King, hell awaits us no more. An eternity of joy in the presence of God is ours. Not because we deserved it, but because Christ deserved it for us. This is our story to tell. This is why we send people to, to foreign mission fields to tell people there about the gospel. And, and you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you're not sent to a foreign mission field, that since God ordains the times and places that men live, then right where you are, your neighborhood, your workplace, your school, the ball fields where you go, the stores where you shop, the places you go out to eat, those are the places you're to be sharing the gospel. He sent you there. He sent me where I go. We don't need, shouldn't need, missionaries to come from, from across the, the ocean to come here to tell us the good news of the gospel. We have Christians here. We need to open and tell people about Jesus. We don't know if it's a person's day of salvation. We don't know if they will ever accept the gospel. All we know is that it is ours to tell. It's our story to tell. I often use as a metaphor, you know, over in our office, we have a copying machine that we bought from this company. And the company's based out of someplace up in Pennsylvania. But when we need help with the copier, they send the guy that lives in Smyrna. You say, why do they send him? Why don't they send some guy from New Jersey or Massachusetts or New York or Pennsylvania? And you would say, why? Well, because that guy's already here. Well, if there's people here that need to hear the gospel, then God looks and says, you're already there. You're already there. Go tell them about me. Well, I have just two things, two points I want to take with us. The first is rather short, and the two points are this. If you're not saved, you're not saved. The second one is, if you are saved, you are saved. 
Number one, if you're not saved, you're not saved. I read an article the other day, which is astounding to me, about a number of people who go to Christian churches, proclaim to be Christians, and don't believe the Bible. I don't understand it. It's terrifying to me. There's a large group of people who call themselves Christians, go to Christian churches, that think everyone will end up in heaven no matter what. I don't get that either, but that's a topic for another day. The Bible is clear. I believe what the Bible says. I believe what Jesus says. And Jesus says there's a day coming when he's going to have two groups of people. Matthew 25 refers to it as sheep and goats. The sheep will be taken. The sheep are the, the Christians will be taken into an eternity of joy with him. The goats will end up eternally in hell. Again, the Bible is clear about this, which is why the gospel is so urgent. Jesus said, I am, he didn't say a way, a truth, a life. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And Paul tells us, if they believe in him, they'll be saved. But how are they going to believe in him unless somebody tells them? And how are they going to, somebody going to tell them if, if we keep our mouths shut? We've got to go and tell. Because without that, people are dying. It's happening all across the globe, and it's happening right here. Well, the second point is this. If you are saved, you are saved. And this is where we're going to refer to that little insert that's in your bullet in those verses. Church, you, you already know this, that I believe that once Christ saves you, you remain saved forever. Some people think that's crazy talk. Some people say it's heresy. I just want to look and say, what does the Bible say? The first one listed there is the passage that we've just covered, and we've already said quite enough about that. So let's go to Ephesians 1. Verses 13 and 14. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. If it were up to me to hold on to your salvation, you might be in trouble. I would do my best. I would want you to stay saved. But if it was up to me to hold on to it, you would be probably in trouble. But it's not up to me, and it's not up to you. It says here, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. If you heard the salvation and believed it, if you heard the gospel and believed it, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The guarantee. Guarantee. God guarantees something, you know, it's not like a car guarantee, right? Well, if something doesn't work, they'll hopefully fix it. No, it's a guarantee. It's going to be like this and stay like this forever. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, look at verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Being born again is like being born. And you've heard me tell the story a hundred times. You know, Ed has two sons. I love his two sons. They could come over to my house. They could cut the grass. They, they could wash my car. They could, they could feed the dog. They could do all these kinds of chores. Guess whose sons they would be? The Ed's sons. All their work does not make them my sons. My kids born into my family weren't born into my family because they cut the grass and washed the car and did the chores. They were born into my family. Now, I want them to do those things to help keep harmony in our family. And, and, and as you know, grateful children, you want them to do the work that they're supposed to do. As Christians, we're supposed to do good works. But we're not born into anything because of what we did. We're born again because of the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the grace and mercy of God and the work of Jesus. Philippians 1.6 I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. If you could lose your salvation, that means this isn't true. And I believe every word in here is true. I have to believe this. He who began a good work will bring it to 
completion. I think God finishes what he starts. 1 John 5.13 I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know and have eternal life. Not that you may have eternal life, that you may know that you have eternal life. You know what you have. And then you probably knew we were going here, Romans 8. Verse 38. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul lists all the things that we might think of, and then in case there's something he didn't think of, he says, or anything else, nothing exists, nothing exists, including you, that is powerful enough to remove Christ's salvation from you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So then you would say, okay, and who's he talking about? These people that have fallen away. Well, I say it's just like those Israelites who got to the promised land. But to be clear, if we want a New Testament reference, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. And coming across this verse and understanding it years ago brought so much clarity to me because I've seen with a broken heart I don't know how many people come and leave. And some come and leave, and they go to another church, praise God. Some come and leave. They're Christians. They go somewhere else uh, 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 to worship, praise God for that. Some come and leave and, and just go home. And I can't judge their hearts and would never judge their hearts. But, but from the fruit of that, I'd be very concerned about the, the state of their soul. And John writes this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Like the majority, the vast majority of the Israelites at the gate to the promised land, the vast majority did not accept God. The vast majority rejected God. Of all the people over the age of 20, it would seem from what we read that only Joshua and Caleb were faithful. These people in the book of Hebrews, many of them were Christians. Many of them had stayed with the Christians for a long time. As the writer said, they'd fallen away. Again, because someone stops coming to church, I would say that I know definitely that they're not Christians, but I'd be greatly concerned for them. We should reach out to them. We should talk to them about the gospel. I mean, you can initiate the conversation with how you been, Phillies are having a great year. Are you going to church? How come? How are you with the Lord? I hope they're saved and they just want a little bit and they're ready to, to come somewhere to, to a good church somewhere. But perhaps this will be your opportunity to bring the gospel to them before that day when it's too late. There is horror in rejecting Christ. But, brothers and sisters, there is nothing more opposite than horror in accepting Christ. So we should, as Paul commanded, to test ourselves to see if we're in the faith. But if you're in the faith, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and profess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, then you are saved forever. Go do things God wants you to do. Be a grateful child of God. But know you're on the shadow of a doubt. That you can be assured, blessed assurance, with great joy, that you can have in this life until the day with greater untold joy 
your Savior takes you home. Lord God, we thank you and praise you for the work of Christ. Lord, won't you help us to shine that light to others that they may know. Amen.